Cool. So, I'm Rosie from Culture24. I think most of you probably know what we do. Um, we bring arts and heritage organisations together to do amazing things that they couldn't do on their own. Things like the Let's Get Real Action Research projects and conferences. Uh, we publish various websites. We do a massive amount of amazing data sharing. And we run the Museums at Night Festival. So Museums at Night, the twice yearly festival every May and October of exciting after hours lates in all kinds of cultural and heritage venues. Um, give me a cheer, anyone who's been to a Museums at Night event. Yay! Yay! Give me a cheer, anyone who's run a Museums at Night event. Yeah. You guys are the legends. Thank you. So how do we run museums at night? Well, there are actually only two of us. There's myself and uh, campaigns manager, Mr. Nick Stockman. We are it. Um, so we have a few challenges uh, bringing hundreds and hundreds of events to the public every year when we don't actually coordinate the events ourselves. So main challenges we're looking at here, how to improve the way that we provide info to both our network of venues and to the public. We want to save money and do it as efficiently as possible. We want to use our time more productively. And if possible, we want to bring in some money to support the festival. So I'm going, to show you, you, I'm going to share with you three simple stories about things that we've done. And the first thing is streamlining our email newsletters. So at Culture24, we had multiple mailing lists. Don't know if anyone here is in the same position where you have multiple projects and people sign up to get news about the projects that they're interested in. The issue is that we had separate lists by interest, so the same email address was in there multiple times, inflating our subscriber count and MailChimp charges you more based on your total subscriber count. So this was a big project. It took lots of careful data work, but we wanted to end up with one integrated list combining both sector and public email addresses that we could then segment by what the people were interested in and how they behaved, how frequently they clicked and opened. So what was absolutely terrific was ending up with one single set of sign-up form questions. So following best practice, rather than people saying to me on the phone, please add me to your mailing list, and me saying, no worries, I'll type your email in, it's actually far better to get people to add themselves and then receive a double opt-in email that they then confirm. So this is our standard opt-in form from the We Are Culture 24 site listing all the projects that people might be interested in. We're saying, do you work in the arts or heritage sector? Yes or no, it's usually yes. What do you, what do, you do? What are you interested in? And where do you live? This is the same form on the Museums at Night site. So we get visitors both from the public and from the sector. So it's compulsory. They must tell us, are you in the sector? Do you just want the sector facing content? Or are you a member of the public? Do you want to hear about events that you can go to? Um, it's auto ticked. I'm interested in museums at night. But if they want other stuff from us, that's fine. This meant that we could do a re-engagement campaign. So this is for people who have been on the list for ages. They haven't opened, they haven't clicked. We're not sure whether they want to keep hearing from us. So we started very gently with this, you know, quite, um, quite friendly text. We've been sending you info about museums at night. You might be interested in other things. Why not update your profile? You know, we're not going to spam you. We're friendly and win an Amazon voucher. That was the first message. Um, this was the sector message to people who said, I'm interested in sector-facing content, but they hadn't specified what projects they wanted. So we're a bit more informal. We're involved in tons of projects. We only want to send you the stuff you want to read, so please help us help you. This was the next one. We thought maybe we're a bit wordy. Maybe we should just show people buttons that they can click instead of giving them a paragraph of text to read. Update your profile or unsubscribe. At each of these stages of campaigns, more people did update, but we're still not there yet. Finally, this is, um, this is the latest one. Last chance, quick personal question. You're not opening our newsletters. Do you still want to hear stuff? Yes or no? Now, I was surprised. I thought people who are getting our newsletters, there's an unsubscribe link at the bottom of everything. Surely they're going to click it. No, they didn't bother. Tons of them actually took the time to click. No, thanks. OK, no problem. We can unsubscribe to you. That's fine. 
But the other brilliant thing, and this is a tip that I want to share with anyone who's doing comms and particularly running competitions, our public list are very, very engaged with competitions, prizes, ticket giveaways, that sort of thing. And we do these using Wufu, the online form builder. So here's an example of one of our ticket giveaway competitions, what it looks like to members of the public. Um, and just before we did this integration, just to show you what it was like in terms of our time, when people entered, I'd have to pull out a spreadsheet of competition entrants, I'd have to clean the data, I'd have to order it, then I'd have to paste it into MailChimp, and I would usually find that the majority of people entering the competitions were on our mailing list already, and it was just a massive hassle every time we did a competition. But now, with integration, this is automatic. And it's terrific. You can integrate your forms with all these different CRM systems. You can even take payments if you want to. And here is how you do it in the back end. Um, under notification settings, you just say, I want to notify MailChimp. Double opt-in is sorted. And it's so simple and it's brilliant. And this has saved me a ton of time. I hope it's useful to you. So the results so far from our mailing list work, we have a smaller list now, there's fewer people on it, but they are more engaged. The open rates are up, the click rates are up. Um, we will see whether it means more people actually going along to events. I get the feeling it will. Um, it means we spend less time manually adding people to mailing lists, but the research continues into this. Our next challenge was the one about generating income online. So I don't know if you've heard of Van Gogh yourself, Culture 24's uh, art selfie game. And we run off, ran our first ever crowdfunder with this. And we learned a lot about the challenges, about the difficulties, and what we didn't want to do next time for museums at night. Um, thinking about who might actually want to fund it, finding the right platform to do the crowdfunder, the one where your audience already is really clearly articulating the need for, for the project. It's got to be really easy to understand. It's got to be relevant to the audience. Um, it was hugely time consuming. The, the Van Gogh Yourself crowdfunder, we were successful. We got the money. 64 people donated and 62 of them were personal friends of our CEO. So it didn't, it didn't reach new people. So from that, we learned what to do differently for the Museums at Night crowdfunder. So for this one, we were really keen to actually tell a story and explain to people, if you donate, you can make a difference. We wanted to suggest a specific sum of money, just benchmarking it. We wanted to say it will be in your area, it will affect you, Oops, sorry. And we wanted it to result in more events. So this is the call to action. Three pounds will help create amazing museums at night events in your area. Lovely photo of a brilliant event at National Museum Scotland. We had a specific window of opportunity that we could run this in. We have the Connect competition every year where we match up venues with artists and it's a massive public vote. Tons of people come to the website and they want to vote for their local museum to win the chance to work with an artist. So we have this voting widget and it reaches a critical mass of people and we wanted to find a way of harnessing that and seeing if we could nudge people, people who had already taken the step of becoming a fan and voting into maybe donating to support more of this sort of thing in future. So we set up our Culture24 organisation page on Just Giving, the platform that most people from the UK are aware of, they already use for charity donations. This is where people are. We set up a specific fundraising campaign. We did so we knocked together a little video and we did a bit, a bit more creative copywriting, explaining that we're challenging stereotypes about museums being boring. Um, we're doing amazing collaborative creative events that you can come along to and just three pounds will help us to continue this work. And we gave examples of some of the most creative and inspiring museums and night events of the last few years. Men in Black Parade through Scunthorpe, Grace and Perry's Teddy Bear Hunt in Yorkshire, Bon Pass and Par flooding the SS Great Britain with green jelly. All these things which are, they're, they're really memorable moments. And we integrated this donate link not only into the Connect voting widget, but also into the Museums at Night website, into our email newsletters, that little purple button, and the yellow tab there is in our email signatures. And it worked. 
And this surprised me. It seemed to appeal to people's sense of community. And we got over £300 from individual donors, little chunks at a time. What we did with this, we put together the Museums at Night People's Fund and invited museums to apply to us for a £100 bursary to support some really creative event programming. And there'll be events coming up at Surgeons Hall in Edinburgh, at the Infirmary in Worcester and at the Jeffrey Museum in London. So if you haven't planned where you're going to go for Museums at Night next week, um, I would encourage you to check out these three. There were some challenges. It's not easy tracking donations exactly where they're coming in from. Um, you only get the contact details of the people who've given you money if they agree to share them, and most don't. Most are just anonymous benefactors. If any of you are in the room now, thank you. Um, or if anyone's watching this anywhere else, thank you. Um, I wish we could continue a relationship with you. I wish we could email you and thank you and send you details of events you might like to go along to, but I guess we'll never know. The other thing is that just giving charge a monthly fee. So it's fine if you're doing a specific campaign and you know that you're going to get that amount of money in at least, but keeping it ticking over longer when you don't have that call to action and you don't have the big spike in visitors to your site, that can be a bit challenging. The other thing we noticed was that quite a few people actually gave more than £3. So we set that nudge point at quite low. So now we have it slightly higher. Now we have tiered giving. Um, donate £3, donate £10 and get an event ticket, donate £20, uh, we'll pop your name on this website and send you two event tickets. And this is, this is as we're getting more and more visitors to the site, we think we're going we're gonna to see some success from this, but we will see. The next experiment that we did is one about live chat, um, which is a platform you can use on your website to communicate with site visitors. And our challenge here, when the festival is on and when there's only two of us, there are so many incoming inquiries. The phone rings off the hook and mostly if it's someone wanting help finding an event, you have to actually take the time to talk them through their journey across your website to find where they need to get to. And then more often than not, we'd have to start sending them a follow up email with links and things. This is just not sustainable when you've got 700 events. So we wanted to try and simplify our response to incoming inquiries down to one single interaction. And live chat is a really interesting way of doing this that scales far better. So here's an example of um, live chat on a website. It's used quite often by festivals. This is used by Glyndebourne. You click start chat, little pop-up appears. <coughs> And we decided to go with a free service called Zopim, which is easy to integrate into our WordPress website. Um, here it is on our site. So if you're searching for an event, you'll see the live chat is quite unobtrusive, just down in the bottom right there. And we can customize the colors so it looks like it's part of the site. But then if you click on it, uh, this is what pops up. Festival live support, type your message in here. Um, here's what we can see from our dashboard from the other side. You don't get very much analytics, but that's fine. You don't really need very much. Um, you can see we've got quite a few um, active visitors. There's even more idle visitors who've just got to open in a tab along with many other tabs. Um, it surprised me how many international visitors we had. And actually, in terms of their inquiries, um, I found I was performing a sort of a tourist information service for Visit Britain. Um, so... In this case, it was um, a set of visitors from Belgium who knew they were coming to the northwest of England. They're not going to phone us, and they're less likely to email us with a query. Um, but in this case, we were able to have a back and forth discussion, point them in the direction of some resources, wish them a marvelous holiday. They all went away happy. Um, here was another um, chat which I wasn't expecting. This, um, this was a teacher planning a trip to Nottingham for a group of sixth formers. Um, it turned out that maybe there weren't any museums at night events planned for Nottingham at the time she emailed, but I was able to say, hey, I know some people at the venues in Nottingham. Let me send an email connecting you with um, the Galleries of Justice and backlit event planners. They will probably be able to arrange something for your school kids. All will be well. It helped. One of the real things that we do is reassuring new visitors, people who've not been to that venue before. The sort of questions we get are people's doubts. Oh, if it opens at six, can I turn up later? Or can you recommend something in the East Midlands? The more unusual, the better. In this case, I said, go to the T-Rex rampage. 
Um, we also get a lot of feedback about technical challenges. So in between festivals, it's venues that get in touch. For instance, do you have examples of previous events? Yes, we do. And clearly, we need to make this more obvious on our site. Then during the festival, it's members of the public having difficulty finding where to go. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so I've got to zip on. Um, there are challenges. You've got to be online to respond. This chap came yesterday while I was going through my presentation to ask a question. He vanished within a minute because I didn't get to it quickly enough, and now I can never tell him what his nearest museum at night event in Norwich is because he didn't leave an email address. So this does not replace email or phone calls. It's a nice extra. It has tons of benefits. Um, we can give personalised guidance and build direct links and improve our relationships both with the sector and with the public. So next steps, we'll continue developing the newsletters, we're planning new rewards for our next step of fundraising. Live chat is on now at the Museums at Night website, my colleague Nick is waiting for your queries. And our current experiment is trialling a social media thunderclap announcing the festival. Um, if you would like to join it, that would be lovely. Museums at Night is next week. It's Thursday, Friday and Saturday night. I hope you get to go to something. Thank you very much. Thank you.